Welcome to our welcome to our fifth season of Archaeology Cafe. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing that we've been able to to continue this conversation for starting our fifth year, and I welcome you all back. Um, I'd like to start off tonight by handing the microphone to Bill Dolly, our organization's president, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Doug, and thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, as Doug said, this is our fifth year of Archaeology Cafes, and the really exciting thing is that uh, recently we were awarded a uh, grant from the Arizona Humanities Council, and we're taking the cafe concept up to Phoenix. So we have three of these uh, events scheduled for Phoenix uh, this fall. And if you didn't pick one up on the way in, there's a postcard on the table here that lists the uh, this and six more of these events uh, for this uh, upcoming season. So th these are sponsored by Archaeology Southwest. Uh, a year ago, we were the Center for Desert Archaeology, but starting on January 3rd, we became Archaeology Southwest, which is the name of our uh, quarterly magazine. And we do preservation archaeology, which is a, involves research, public outreach. An event like this is one of the important uh, uh, items in that we use to uh, reach out to a broad public audience and we also protect archaeological sites by owning them and holding conservation easements and one of the benefits of membership in Archaeology Southwest is our quarterly magazine and this one addresses exactly that issue the first issue under our new name what is preservation archaeology so uh, I urge you all, if you're not uh, aware of what we do and uh, our membership program, to pick that information up. And you may be wondering what uh, a session that's focused on some of the standing architecture of Tucson is. What are archaeologists doing sponsoring that kind of a talk? Well. We've made the point in previous cafes that what Tucson is about is really 4,000 years of layers of, of history building up. And basically, we're just talking about that uppermost layer. <laughs> and it's that landscape that we see every day that uh, covers the archaeological uh, deposits that are also of broad interest and importance to this community. So I think this is a great opportunity to uh, start from the top down like archaeologists do and uh, I will uh, turn this over to Doug for the wrapping up for uh, the introductions here. Thank you all for coming out. Okay, um, I do see a few uh, new faces tonight so I just want to briefly explain how this event works. Um, we really want this to be uh, an open happy hour sort of discussion. Um, this isn't people lecturing down to you, this is a, a conversation with the community and we really look forward to hearing your questions. We do record these presentations so that we can rebroadcast them on, on the internet. Um, the center has uh, got members all over the, all over the, really all over the world, and we want to be able to share this event with with those folks. And um, a surprising number of college classes have actually started using our, our videos as part of their curriculum. So, um, and part of that that is a reflection on you all because of the really high quality of questions that get asked. Um, if you do uh, want to ask a question, I would ask that you. Do the elementary school, uh, raise your hand so that I can get the microphone to you so that the camera can record your question. And um, if you feel a little shy about uh, asking a question out loud, there are pads of paper and pens on all of the tables. I brought my reading glasses. Feel free to write down your question, and I will, I'll collect them as I walk around and uh, read the questions out loud. Um, in terms of, of working with uh, Casa Vicente, they, th the staff here does an absolutely amazing job of keeping us all uh, well fed and um, keep, keep keeping the drinks delivered. Um, but I would ask that you make sure that you try to deal with just one waiter or waitress. Asking um, different people for different things can kind of make things a little bit confusing. So we're going to open up the floor to our, to our presentation. Um, uh, Damien and Helen are going to talk about some of the really wonderful things they've been doing for historic preservation in Tucson. Thank you very much, Doug. So, yeah. 
So my name is Damien Klinko, and, um, and I um, wear a number of different hats when it comes to preservation. I, I really have the extraordinary privilege of serving on the board um, for Archaeology Southwest, um, which is such a dynamic and just incredible institution. Um, so it's always a pleasure to come out and help and support that organization in any way possible. So I encourage you, if you're not members, become one. I just need to make an extra plug for that. So um, I also serve as the president of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. And in that role, we, um, in the role, the, the, um, I really get an opportunity to really look at so many incredible, different, and dynamic types of historic resources in our city. And um, you know, preservation is like one part audacity, one part persistence, and two parts timing. And you really have to sort of approach each project and each sort of preservation topic with an entirely fresh slate, and then start from scratch and sort of build an, an entire strategy for how um, to get to from point A to point B. Um, so I'm going to talk about two. Well, we're going to talk about two different um, two different um, projects that the Preservation Foundation has been working on um, for the last year and a half, um, and two years in one case. Um, with me, I have Helen Erickson, who is a, a graduate student in landscape architecture um, at the University of Arizona, who was a principal author of a study about the uh, Garrett Ekbo Tucson Community Center landscape, which will um, she'll talk about in the second in the second half of the presentation. I'm gonna talk about the Marist College and sort of its historic context, um, what it is, why it should be preserved, and then um, sort of talk about where its future is going and sort of how we've gotten there. So, um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand throughout the talk. I, I, I would love to try to answer as we're going along. So, the Marist College was part of a very distinctive and critical program that was um, created by Tucson's second bishop, Henri Grandjean, um, in 1915. And the second bishop of Tucson was really interested in building a monumental scale architecture for this community as this city was emerging out of the, um, out of the turn of the century and becoming sort of a gr this vision of what uh, a great southwestern city should be. And so part of that was to create sort of monumental works of architecture. And Marist College was part of a program to do that. And in, in his conception of how to create this architectural style and bring this new, this new large-scale architecture, he wanted to bring religious institutions to our city. So he went out and started, started lobbying different institu uh, religious Catholic groups to come to Tucson and actually establish a center here. And so he was involved in bringing the Benedictine Sisters, um, the Carmelite Order, which he established at the Santa Cruz Mission Church, which is on 22nd Street and 6th Avenue, um, and the Marist Brothers, who was, were a group of educating, educating um, fathers who s established schools for primarily underserved populations throughout the world. And so he, he went and he, he reached out to them in Texas and Mexico, and he said, you know, we could really build an incredible institution in Tucson and really serve an under, a really underrepresented population. And he raised the money from the community and built Marist College. And to do this, he hired uh, Manuel Flores, who was really one of Tucson's premier masons, who did um, most of the large-scale adobe projects in our city. Um, the same year that Marist College was constructed, he also built Teatro Carmen, which is in the Barrio Viejo Historico, which was um, considered the premier Spanish language theatrical theater. In, in our city, and he was also the arch, he was also the builder in charge of the Santa Cruz Mission on um, 22nd and 6th Avenue. And the Marist College um, was conceived as a uh, Italianate revival building. It was built out of this sort of tradition of bringing these high European styles to Tucson. And again, this theme of trying to bring to Tucson these outside ideas to make a grand city. The Marist College is the largest adobe building in the state of Arizona. It stands at 52 feet tall. Um, Casa Grande may or may not be, I mean, if you consider it prehistory, it might be a little smaller. <laughs> but uh, in terms of the historic, historic record, historic era, it's really, um, it's really the tallest adobe building in the state. The, um, the building is um, 15,000 square feet. So it's, it's, it's three stories. It has a basement level. Um, which has about 18 foot high ceilings, a uh, se center section that has about um, 14 foot high ceilings, and a third floor that has about the same height. And um, there was um, limited electricity available when they built the building, so it has huge windows to let in as much natural, natural light as possible. 
And when the school was built, it was, it was, really, it was the first non-segregated school in Tucson. It was really built for everybody. And in 1922, when the second bishop of Tucson passed away, it was open for women too. So it was really a boys' school, and then it was really open for everybody. And the, um, if you look on the handout, on the uh, the the second, in the ins inside of the, of, there's an incredible picture that really shows all of the students. This is from the 1950s, but it shows sort of the diversity and um, the extraordinary um, actual amount of kids being serviced by this um, institution. So um, the building, um, so I should probably walk through some of these photos. Um, the building was, is part of the cathedral campus. So the cathedral was really the epicenter of, um, of religion, of Catholic religion, not just in Tucson, but in the entire state of Arizona, part of New Mexico and part of Texas. The diocese had a very large reach and uh, a very large authority at the turn of the century. And this really was the epicenter of that. So in, in the 1880s, the Catholic Church began a program to build a cathedral, and they built it in a Gothic revival style. Um, in the 1920s, that style was sort of outdated, and again, this consistent attempt to sort of reinvent themselves as a center of major architecture for our city. They refaced the front of the cathedral in a, um, in a, in a mission revival style, which there's actually the small drawing in the bottom which came out of the office of Henry Jostad. Um, and so the, the, bottom, the bottom sections of the cathedral, the squares, bases, um, well that was the Gothic, the Gothic center, and then they built on top of that Gothic platform, um, the towers. Um, the, the Marist College was really second in line in, this, in the block development, followed by Our Lady um, Chapel, which is right next to the Marist College, which is another adobe building designed by um, Grand Jean and built by Flores. Um, and then the Cathedral Hall, which is the third building in the program. And if you flip onto the back, um, you'll see this is the, this is the um, chapel, and then this is the parish hall. And the parish hall actually has a, has a full proscenium inside, and it housed some of Tucson's first symphony performances, and was really, again, the, the diocese trying to create an epicenter, a cultural epicenter in the city. So the Marist College served as a boys' school until the 1960s when, it, um, when the school closed and it became the offices for the, Marist, for, the di for the actual diocese of Tucson. And the diocese at this point was starting to shrink. Phoenix established its own diocese, so their authority and, um, and resources began to, began to um, become a little less. So um, the diocese moved their offices into the building, and they occupied the building until the mid, uh, early, early to mid-1990s. And they outgrew their space and they were looking for a new building downtown, so they relocated down the street and the building sat vacant. And we, what we really know from historic preservation is the one thing you don't want to do with a historic building is leave it empty. Um, because maintenance sort of begins to stop and problems start to arise and they're not fixed. And a palm frond blew onto the roof of the, of the Marist College. Um, clogging the scupper, and there was a large torrential monsoon, which caused water to back up on the entire roof. The, the building has a flat roof, but it's surrounded by a parapet, and it has canales that get the water off the roof as fast as possible when it rains. And so when the water backed up, the canale had already started to rust, and it, the canale failed. And all this water poured directly into the wall of the building. Um, and if you have an adobe building, the one thing you don't want to do is have it wet, because you end up with a uh, Mud. <laughs> so the um, so in addition, in the 1960s, um, the um, the diocese had there was a, a salesman who came to town and said, you know, we have the best fix for the stucco problems you're having with this building. We can spray on this new super stucco called Tough Tex, and um, boo to Tough Tex. <laughs> tough Tex um, Tough Tex is an asbestos-based product that um, that is not permeable. And, um, and, and so a normal, a normal adobe building wicks water up the wall and then it dries out and the, um, the, the um, plaster, lime plaster, allows the building to continue to breathe. Um, when the tuftex was added, there was no ability for the building to breathe. So when the water went in, it stayed in and it caused the collapse of the northwest corner of the building. And so a relatively, I mean, a, a w the building needed, needed intervention, but a relatively small problem, which was cleaning the gutter, um, suddenly caused a, a multi-hundred-thousand-dollar problem. And so the building sat and sort of waited. 
And a number of community groups said, oh, we really need to figure out some way of saving this building. And the diocese um, really has, has struggled to really make a case and an argument for, for spending their, their finite resources to, to restore the building because they don't have a practical use for it today. So they, they have offices, they just don't need, they have a lot of vacant buildings throughout the city and they don't need another ex very expensive vacant building. So, so we approached the diocese um, about two and a half years ago and we said, well, what could we do to find a path, a path to preservation? And the, um, the city of Tucson had been interested in, in the building and had been looking for, looking for some solutions. It's an eyesore in downtown and yet it has this incredible potential. It's an inc such a remarkably elegant building. And the, um, you know, there was a, a lack of traction to move any sort of solution forward. And sitting down with the bishop, it was really the first time that anyone from, the, from outside the Catholic Church had gone to him from the community and said, you know, this building really matters to the fabric of our city. And that was a really compelling argument for him. And so suddenly he said, well, let's see what we can do. Let's see what, how we can dialogue to find a path to, uh, to, to finding perhaps new owners, to finding funding. Um, so the Preservation Foundation, we prepared a National Register nomination and listed the building on the National Register at the state level of significance. Um, the, that work was done by Jen Lefstick, who is a, uh, a board member on, on, the, on the foundation and also an archeologist. Um, we, um, we then approached, we, we said, well, wh what sort of funding is available for this scale of project? Because it needs at least a million dollar intervention. Buildings can develop what's called a preservation deficit, which means that there is a X amount of dollars needed before, the before it sort of gets to revenue neutral, where then an investor can come in and actually make the building viable and profitable. Historic buildings really need to support themselves in our current economy, so it's all about creating a, a vibrant and, um, and economically, um, um, economically potential um, kind of scheme. So we, so, we, so we sat down with um, a variety of different stakeholders. We, uh, we enlisted the help of the Downtown Tucson Partnership, and we actually crafted a, a number of um, pro forma to see what, what would really be the best return on investment in terms of taxes if we could get the city to spend um, some of its funding specifically targeted for blight. Because the city of Tucson gets an allotment from the federal government each year from HUD, and there are a variety of different categories that funding is applied to, and one of those categories is blight abatement. And traditionally, the city of Tucson has used this blight abatement funding to demolish vacant, historic vacant and neglected buildings, many of which are historic. So it seemed like a great opportunity to maybe turn, turn the corner and see how we could use some of this money to, re to remediate the blight by stabilizing the building. And so we began this um, really interesting um, com sort of community discussion with a variety of stakeholders at the table. Um, and we, we crafted a plan to put out an RFP and actually find out, is there really interest in our community? And in, in really broadly throughout the country in perhaps redeveloping this building. And there was, so there were over, um, we walked over 40 people through the building in about a month and a half. People flew in from all over the country. People were interested in developing the concepts of boutique hotels or class A office space and restaurants were almost always in the mix. And um, in the end, there were two really good viable, viable um, scenarios um, with which to move the building forward. And, and with those scenarios, the city of Tucson made an initial commitment to invest $1.2 million in this blight abatement funding to stabilize, to stabilize the building. That means that the private sector will have to come in with another two to three million dollars to really transform this building into something that generates revenue. But that act financially works. So right, that's where sort of where we are in this process. And now the city of Tucson and the diocese are in negotiations and discussions on exactly how that process will happen. Because part of the part of the funding going to the building is that it moves out of the ownership of the, of the diocese and into the private sector and it's put back on the tax rolls and really starts to generate revenue for our city. Um, uh, some, no, when we, in the uh, equations that we were looking at, the pro forma, really pr looked like it was gonna be a 10% return annually on this, on this investment in terms of taxes, which is, which is really huge. So the building will certainly pay for itself many times over in the, in the coming decades. So that's sort of where we are on that, on that building. And interestingly, right across the street, literally across the street, you can see it from the, from the 
top stories of the Marist College is um, an incredible uh, modernist landscape designed by Garrett Ekbo, who was, um, you will find out, is one of the great landscape architects um, in this country. And so I'm gonna pass this over to Helen, but maybe I should ask, see if there's a few questions um, before, before we hand over and talk about um, sort of another case study looking at something 40 years, 50 or 60 years later. Yes, yes, back there first. <coughs> Okay, so the, um, the Marist College is located on the corner of Church and Corral Street. It's on the, it is on the north, and you can actually walk there. If you just walk down, uh, walk down Stone, you should be able to see it um, right, behind the, uh, right behind the cathedral. Wait, there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Damien, uh, I wanted to know if all that water created all that black mold that we're all so afraid of. So th there actually doesn't appear to be much mold in the building at all. Um, it really just it got wet and it uh -huh. collapsed off. Uh -huh. um, and then tarps were tarps covered covered the adobe. So there really isn't uh, there really isn't a significant mold problem. The bigger problem is the asbestos. Uh -huh. What is it going to be f uh, t uh, finally used for the building? Well, again, again, the final use is yet to be determined. I see. Um, okay. But I think that it, the, it has a high probability that it will be Class A office spaces and a restaurant, uh -huh. or perhaps a mixed use with um, some residential units, offices, and and a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And my last question as a student is, what criteria was used to establish significance? So we, so we listed it under criterion, um, under criterion C for community development and planning, and also criterion A for architecture. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Once you said it was uh, co-ed, since 1922, and then later you said it stopped being a boys' school in 1960. Did you speak on that? So, so it stopped. It stopped being a school in the 1960s, but it was co-ed from the 1920s through the 19 through the 1960s. Damien, what's the possibility for private um, donations to preserve the building? I How can we help? So the best thing to do if you want to help is um, tomorrow morning call the Diocese of Tucson and tell them that this building really, really matters. I mean, these, these negotiations are still happening. Um, there's, you know, it, anything could happen. And so I think hearing from the community that this building is important and something that the diocese really should be saving and putting energy and effort behind finding a path to preservation is critical. So if you get a chance tomorrow, call, call Bishop Kakanis' office and tell them, save the Marist College, whatever it takes. Question back here. Damien, what are the specific next steps and what do you imagine a timetable might be for those next steps? So once, the, once an agreement is hammered out between the city and the diocese, and I'm optimistic it will be, um, then really the next step um, would be the city, so the money, the, this federal money w will pass th through the city of Tucson to, to restore this building. We, there's a, a number of different scenarios that can happen. Um, an, an LLC can, can be established that can hold the building. Um, this, is a, this is a historic tax credit eligible project. If any of you have done large or even sometimes small historic preservation projects, you can accumulate historic tax credits. Um, but it has to be a for-profit entity. So you can actually accumulate those tax credits on the CDBG blight abatement funding if it passes through an LLC. Um, my, my guess is that it will be about a year um, from start to completion. Um, it could be a little less, um, but between the asbestos remediation, which as you know, Corky, can take a lot longer than um, anticipated um, to get through the, that process. Um, between the between the asbestos remediation and um, and then the actual stabilization, the the stabilization would include building a structural system, a frame system inside of the building that will take the pressure off the walls. Um, there are a number of structural engineers who do not specialize in historic preservation in, in this community who will tell you a building like this shouldn't be standing, um, but it clearly has and, and stood for almost a hundred years. So even despite missing um, one and a half corners, so I mean it is. <laughs> And it's been it's been structurally monitored, so it's not cracking apart, and it's uh, it's really it's really stable. So it really is an amazing piece of architecture. Um, uh, you know I, how the details of the construction are done. I think that's all still going to be hammered out. My guess is it'll be handled through the City of Tucson Historic Preservation Office. Oh. 
Okay. And now Helen. So I'm going to talk about something that um, there are no asbestos problems here. <clears throat> and so uh, in, it's not working. Is it working? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, across the street from the Marist College uh, is one of the largest open spaces in downtown Tucson. And this was the area, as you probably mostly know, uh, before uh, the 60s was the center of a very lively Mexican-American community. And uh, in terms of money poured in to eliminate blight in cities, uh, a great deal of money was funneled to Tucson, proportionately, of course, uh, to deal with this situation. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, it depends upon how we look at it hundreds of years from now, um, Tucson decided the best way to save their downtown was to eradicate it. So uh, essentially, a huge, a huge area was cleared down here. And if you look at the map on the back of the, um, of the flyer here, you can see that uh, not only was an area completely, everything taken down, but in addition, the streets were rerouted. Now, this landscape essentially uh, lies between Congress Street and Cushing, and then uh, along Chur between Church Street and Granada. When it was first established, Granada Avenue ran further to the east than it does now. It's been moved. The bottom end of Granada, the southern end of Granada, has been moved over. So having, uh, for years and years, these plans went back into the 30s for creating a Pueblo center. Uh, they finally got their act together at the end of the, of the 60s and decided to ask a group of local arch architects if they would be willing to be involved in a venture to reconstruct uh, a theater, an arena, and a music hall, as well as providing a space for shops and a hotel. Now, this was called the community center. It's only been called the convention center, I have to tell you, since the 80s. So it sort of gives you an indication of how things shifted during that period. Um, the two architectural firms who did this as a joint venture were uh, Kane Nelson Wares and Friedman and Joe Bush. And the people who were actually involved in directing it was Edward, called Ned Nelson, and uh, Bernie Friedman were in charge here. So after sort of plan planning the basic locations of buildings and things, because this was what was happening across the United States at the time, they went out looking for a landscape architect who would fulfill the promise of having a green space surrounded by cultural venues. And if you look at a lot of the plans for art centers and things at that time, you'll find that they are exactly like that. You didn't drive cars into the center, you sort of had a green space and the buildings were organized around that. So they considered a lot of the prominent landscape architects of the day. Uh, Lawrence Halpern was one they uh, thought about. Dan Kiley was another. And uh, they went out and looked at all of these landscapes that had been created. And one of the ones that they eventually went to was in Fresno, California. Excuse me. <coughs> This was the Fulton Mall, which had been designed by Garrett Ekbo, who was a uh, landscape architect who at that point was working in Los Angeles. And I brought this pe piece of paper because there was a really very nice article in 1971, which is when the first part of this landscape was opened, that recalled the impact that the Fresno uh, Fulton Mall had had on the two architects who were leading this venture. Uh, it says, we went to Fresno, Nelson recalled, and we watched the people, winos, housewives, oldsters, kids, walking, talking, 
arguing, laughing. The children played in the pools. These were just great spaces. And we asked ourselves, why can't we combine the idea of an open air mall with a community center? And this was really what ECBO was about. Now, Garrett ECBO uh, was born in New York. Uh, he was born in 1910, lived for 90 years, um, and moved as a young person to California. He did his undergraduate work at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, worked for a while, and then went out to the School of Design at Harvard. Thank you. Um, where he got involved with a couple of other students uh, in what is called the Harvard Revolt. Now, uh, <laughs> yeah, the Harvard Revolt. What had happened is with Walter Gropius coming to Harvard, he had a big influence on the general design principles. Before that time, uh, things were uh, in the Beaux-Arts tradition very symmetrical, very rigid, very formal. And uh, Ekbo and two of his other students, two of his colleagues, uh, came up with the idea that this was really quite boring and <laughs> decided that instead of having growies, what they would do is they would create a dynamic uh, concept of landscape. And uh, many of these principles that they came up with are things that you will see in the landscape that way a bit. Uh, a lot of people in Tucson at this point are not really aware that the landscape exists. Uh, it's three sections. The largest section is uh, the section that runs along Church Avenue, down to Cushing, and then over to uh, La Placita Village and to the hotel. And you have the arena in the south, the music hall on the west, and the theater, Leo Rich Theater, on the uh, east side of that. Um, it was a streetscape, first of all. It ran all the way down the street originally. And if you walk down Church Street, what you'll see is an enormous berm running along the side of the street, uh, mostly still uh, turf covered, because that was the way it was designed. As you walk into that plaza, going towards the arena, you will see that there is a very large um, sculpture that has been affectionately called the tank. And um, at that point, uh, if you look again at this uh, little brochure we have here, you can see that, let's see, it's on the, uh, right underneath the uh, central section of the inside, at that point, that was a fountain. And that fountain was really designed so that people could play in it. And uh, of course, that just drove everybody crazy who was in the bureaucracy because they said, you know, this is a risk. We're going to be sued. It's terrible. And so they decided eventually, uh, not too much later, actually, I think it was in the early 80s, to fill that in and to put the sculpture on top of it. One of the problems, of course, is it also blocked the view of the lower plaza. So when you go there today, you sort of have to imagine how this would have been if you didn't have this big piece of sculpture standing there. Um, as you go into the fountain plaza itself, walking into the space between the music hall and the Leo Rich Theater, you sort of move down into the landscape. And again, Ekbo really enjoyed working with landscapes that were not level. The reason is that he was really convinced that landscape architecture had to deal with three dimensions. And one of the things that you will, you will notice if you walk through that and look, every change in elevation also creates a different relationship between the various buildings and the view of the mountains, which you see beyond to the west. Uh, in the Fountain Plaza itself, how am I doing for time? I'm good, OK. In the Fountain Plaza itself, you have uh, an enormous fountain, which the myth is that it is representing Sabino Canyon, um, which could be true, could be not true, but obviously it's water in the desert, right? <laughs> 
And uh, this large fountain is not only a question of water moving through the space at various speeds and things, it's also an amazing soundscape. So that uh, in the areas that are further away from the entrance to the music hall, for example, you have the sound of rushing water, and then there are quieter pools close to where you make the entrance into the music hall. And again, you know, this is something that has to be experienced. Uh, one of the other things that ECPO did was to write about the theory of uh, landscape architecture in the modern style. And his book, uh, <coughs> which was published in 1950, is still in print, by the way, which gives you an idea of sort of its long-term influence. One of the things that he points out there is the fact that landscape, you know, a designed landscape should involve all of the senses. So in this plaza, you can see that you have the sun and the shade, you have the water you can touch. Over by the arena, you have the pines that you can scent. You have eucalyptuses up near the arena. All of these things involve senses other than just the visual sense. And one of the things that he was arguing against was the idea that you had a photograph, you know, sort of the natural uh, concept of everything has a frame. And his opinion, on the other hand, is that as you move through space, you actually have sort of a cone of vision that you see uh, things in, that you don't see things in static frames. So a lot of these things are involved there. The other thing is he was very much influenced by contemporary painters, especially people like Miro and Kandinsky, who had sort of geometric forms that are then interrupted. And this plaza is also a really great example of that kind of thing, because you have arcs coming out from the theater, ranging across that plaza, and a second set of arcs that actually centered on the fountain now the tank, up by the uh, arena, and these reach out into the landscape. So you have the linear geometric patterns that you find in art of the period, but you also have this sense of movement through space, a sort of choreographic sense. And um, looking at the plaza from that point of view, you realize that this is really a masterpiece. And again, I think, it's a place for people. And of course, over the years, what happened is the program got lost, people didn't come, and eventually it became a space where only the people who really love it came, and it was for outsiders, the conventioners. But that was not its original intent, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to fix that, right, Damien? Um, so the next section of this landscape is the walkway. This runs between the hotel and La Placita Village. And at the end of that walkway on the north end, uh, there are pictures again on the back, I think the plan and also some of the early photographs that were taken in the 70s of it. Um, you have a fountain against the wall with sort of bubblers coming up. And behind that was a piece of artwork which is still there and may actually be intentional to this site, unlike a lot of the other artwork down there, that was designed by Robert Tobias, who was a, a teacher at the University of Arizona. And that, um, this section contrasts with the Fountain Plaza in many ways. The materials are different. Whereas in the Fountain Plaza, you had brick grids and grid plantings of trees, and you had sort of the radial design this one is an off-center um, balance design. The rivulet that runs from the wall fountain all the way down the other end of the plaza is slightly off to the west. And again, that was a typical thing that ECBO would have done to sort of give this sense, this is a moving place. It's a dynamic kind of plan. Um, the fountain, once it uh, comes up in the bubbler, goes through a channel that runs through the middle, not the middle, sorry, slightly to the left. I think the proportions are like five to four or something like that if you look at it. Um, and uh, goes through varying widths of channels 
and flows under uh, three obelisks, peephole obelisks that were designed by ECBO. They're made of concrete, you know, form concrete. And then it goes under bridges. So this water is sort of traveling through the space. It gets into a wider passage, it becomes narrow again, goes under some more obelisks. And then at the end, you have three, quote, artesian fountains that sort of bubble up from uh, underground and then flow down the side of the fountains and collect in another basin at the end. What you have here is tile. The channels are lined with tile. Uh, you don't have the brick grid. You instead have brick intersections that tell you uh, where the entrance to the hotel is, uh, where the entrance to La Placita is, and uh, it connects onto the um, walkway that goes along to, across to Presidio Park. You also have, in both of these sections, a huge number of planters. And these planters are not like a standard size or anything. There are five different kinds. You can tell that they are all part of the same design because they sort of come in at the base. But the interesting thing is you have many different sizes of cylindrical planters in the plaza, in the fountain plaza area. And in the walkway, you have uh, rectangular ones, square planters, that again come in at the base. And they were designed with pavement design for the placement of those planters. Some of them are missing now. Also, if you wondered about the benches that run along the walkway fountain there, those are not original. The, and you can tell, you can be very smart about this, you can tell original benches there from the replacement ones, because the original ones are indented at the bottom. And they were not put along the edges of the water course. They're on the side, which I think is, is really interesting, because you can look at the original plan and see where those benches were placed. They were to have wood tops. They've been placed with aluminum. But, you know, essentially it's still there. And there actually is one of those benches also in the uh, fountain plaza. So it's, again, part of this original design. Now, at the opposite end, at the northern end, you have Bente um, de Agosto Park, which is an ordinance Tucson park, although it doesn't have a parcel. And when I was looking for it, it's apparently a median in the road. So if you're wondering what that is, it's a median. Um, However, what you will notice is that you have berms, turf berms, coming through that park, and they are the same style as the turf berms that run along Church Avenue. So what you have there are these berms with rock falls, natural rock falls. The rocks also that you saw in the fountain section and on the berms in the plaza section are repeated over in the uh, park section. And the fountain that is in the northwest, sorry, northeast corner of that park, as it comes down this octagonal fountain, there actually is a, a channel that comes off that with berms on each side that go directly towards the steps going up into La Placita. And so this again was sort of a <coughs> excuse me, a metaphor for how water moves through the landscape and connects to the other sections. All three sections have fountains, and all three sections are sort of a, a metaphorical water course as well. Um, I think one of the things that I found amazing, because I've only been in Tucson now for a little over three years, is when I came here, nobody could tell me about this place. I mean, it's just so extraordinary. It is the only ECBO-designed uh, civic plaza in Arizona. It's one of three plazas that he designed in his entire lifetime. And as Damien and I were discussing, it probably is the largest one. And aside from the various strange things that have happened to it over the years, the, the landscape really has its integrity. I mean, this is something that we don't have to lose. We just have to do a little bit for it right now. Um, I think that um, 
one of the disturbing things that we all that I've come across is the idea that because the barrio was eradicated at that point, somehow this is an evil landscape. But you know, you have to realize that you can't, you know, this is another layer of history in Tucson. So it's important that it's recognized for what it is. And we have the work of this master landscape architect here, and uh, it deserves attention as well. So what we've done is we have put together a uh, conservation plan for it. Um, Park Service approached the Tucson Pima Arts Council in January right, of this year to ask if they could deaccession the landscape. One of the reasons that they did that is because a lot of the systems for the fountains are failing. And it's going to be expensive to repair these. So their solution was that they would take out the water and plant things in the fountains. Now, fortunately, fortunately, there were people, including Corky, on the, on the TPAC um, board who said, wait a minute, we have to look at this first. And that gave Damien and the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation the opportunity to say, we really need to look into what this is. And I must say, when Damien and I first talked about it, I had no idea of how incredibly complex and layered the landscape was. You know, it seemed, it was so cluttered, those little metal seats, there are 98 of them, by the way, I counted them, um, that are just sort of bolted all over the place. And then you have a bunch of artworks that are, you know, just everywhere. And then you have those gates with the lizards on them that are sort of stuck into various corners. And it was very hard to see what was underneath. But fortunately, by going through the conservation plan, we managed to, to start to see what was really there. Then uh, TPAC decided not to deaccession unanimously. And uh, we have been talking to people. Uh, Steve Kozacic has been really helpful to us on this to try to get the, the plan uh, introduced to mayor and council for a study session this fall so that basically the direction that we feel this should go in terms of getting a fountain specialist out to look at what we have to do to make the fountains work, you know, what needs to be repaired, can we put in a landscape plan that echoes the original, replaces missing uh, vegetation, but keeps the same design intent while perhaps respecting the, um, respecting the uh, fact that we are in a very arid climate. The other thing, being a landscape architecture student, that I would love to see would be if we could take the condensate from the buildings around and do some rainwater harvesting and just use that as our sort of showcase for how you use water responsibly in the desert. So, I don't know, have I forgotten anything, Damien? Okay, questions. Helen's also completing a National Register nomination for this, um, for this, for this landscape um, at the national level of significance because it's the work of a master. And it's under, four, it's under 50 years old, which is the, one of the criteria for listing on the National Register, but because of its, ex it's so exceptional and unique, um, it's been determined potentially eligible. Yeah, and we're doing a, a Hall's Historic American Landscape Survey, which will be one of the really the first um, full surveys um, done by Hall's in, in Southern Arizona. Um, can the work be in any way affiliated with the plaza that's over by the Tucson City Hall building and the old... Uh, you know, the old Pima County Court building, uh, which is, I think, going to go to the Tucson Museum of Art soon. And is there any way to incorporate some of this restoring of that as well? Yes, actually, I was down there one Saturday, I think, in February, where people were trying to clean the fountain in Presidio Park as well. And obviously, one of the problems is if you have a fountain out here, you have to treat the water 
because otherwise our water is such that it's going to cause lots of damage. That plaza also was completed in 1971. So it's, it's by a different designer and a very different work. Also, the other one is Mike Burns Plaza, La Placita, with the sort of wavy. The other thing about um, that Presidio Plaza is, you know, that, uh, and I can't, I just can't call the name of the artist, but the uh, concrete work was done by an artist, right. and that concrete work is also over on the Transamerica building, two, two mm -hmm. facades of the Transamerica building, so they should really be d restored as well. What, what I really think has actually been a tremendous outcome of this is I think there's becoming, there's beginning to be a shift within the city of Tucson that modernist landscapes are maybe something that we should be examining instead of eradicating, that we should maybe look into them and understand what we have before uh, we just full-fledge bulldoze them. And um, this is a trend that's actually happening across the country. And so I, 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 I think that if we can get this sort of underway, I think it'll be, it'll be a much easier sell down the road to look at how to maintain and, and retain these in incredible modern landscapes. There's another very small landscape designed by Kane Nelson and we are at the corner, where's on the corner of Stone and um, Broadway, right next to the Chase Bank, the 1920s Chase Bank. And it's a wonderful little landscape that um, its future is sort of nebulous with development projects up and down Broadway. So there, you know, these, these incredible modernist landscapes are, we're, we're part of the West, we're part of this sort of tradition of, um, of modernism and, and, in landscape and so. I, yes, there's someone over here. If, if you want an example today of Eccles Concepts, go to the Tempe Market up in Tempe, Arizona, on the front or the back entrance to Barnes & Noble, you will always see kids playing in the erupting fountain. And that is a very prime example. The, uh, the other issue, uh, La Placida was designed where the, the uh, gazebo is today was designed for a 12-story building and the architectural mm. plans of ac actually I think were submitted to the city many years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, the only thing I know about that area actually is that I spoke with Michael Byrne earlier this year and he told me that he had designed that landscape in front, uh, you know, between uh, Broadway and La Placita, because it's very similar in character to the ECBO. And I wasn't sure at the beginning whether I was looking at an ECBO plaza for which the drawings were missing. But he told me that he had been very much influenced by ECBO's work, and that was why it, the design ended up there. I think it's a very good design. It's just that it's not an ECBO design. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, question back here. Helen, you know, I always wonder why metal structures in this land of the sun and then there is no shade provided for us to be able to use those 90-something seats that are available? <laughs> 98. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, what is up with that? Well, I think, you know, I mean, know, I know it's durable, the, but... Yeah. Is I it think it's one of the problems that this landscape has had is that nobody was in charge. And the result of this is that you have trees, for example, uh, the grids, which are all African sumacs, whatever you think of African sumacs, at this point they have survived. And um, when, when one didn't, they would put in a Chinese pistache, for instance. Well, I think this is part, you know, a friend of mine has pointed out that there are places where non-native plants are appropriate if they are appropriate for the climate. Now, part of the problem here is there is, mulberry was one of the trees that was originally used. And if you go to the section where the mulberry grid still is, you'll see it's not doing very well. And so what would be ideal here, 
I'm sort of keeping that other point in the back of my head. But one of the one of the things that would be ideal would be to have a redesign of the landscape using ECBO's plans, which are at the University of Arizona Library, um, and then creating things that are seen through our eyes as appropriate, but keeping the spirit of the design. And I think that could be very successful. One of the, one of the points here is you probably all know about various treatments for things. Well, rehabilitation would be the treatment that would be appropriate for this landscape. And that means you can make precisely this kind of modification to adapt to existing cir to current circumstances. But back to what I was going to say before, I think one of the big problems this landscape has had is that nobody's really in charge down there. So someone has a good idea. We have never found out where those metal seats came from. So somebody decided to install those partially as a risk management thing, but also just look at the colors, you know. It, it must have had something to do with painting uh, La Placita, which I think happened, Corky, in 19, oh, sorry, 2001 or, or something like that. Uh, so it, it must be fairly recent. They're not in pictures from the 90s, I can tell you that. But again, you know, when you have something like this, you really have to have someone in charge who knows what's going on there. And that would be one of the major recommendations of the, of the conservation plan. Next question here. Helen, I have a, an unreasonable, and unfair, and difficult question to ask you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I knew you were going but to it may, do But maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for everybody sitting here. Uh, there are a large number of people, as you pointed out, that and myself included, who think that the destruction of the 300 houses of Barrio Viejo and the displacement of those families was probably the most serious preservation and urban design crime of this past century. Mm -hmm. um, and I also I agree that um, the work that you're talking about uh, is the master work of probably one of the top three American landscape architects of I the 20th agree. century. I, I guess mm -hmm. I'd put him second. Um, and so my question is, how do you reconcile or how do you convince the community that is still so bitter about the destruction of those neighborhoods or that neighborhood, how do you convince them to embrace the importance of the ECBO landscape at the same time? How do I you do that? How do you deal with that politically? How do you deal with that uh, from a community support perspective? I think that's a totally fair question because I think that's something that it's at the crux of what Tucson is. You know, we have this conflict. It's almost like the Spanish Civil War in some way. You know, it's there and uh, it's still very much alive today. And I think that part of this has to be reaching out to the Mexican American community and saying, look, this was not a really good idea. And I think the fact that, you know, in the 60s we lost a lot. And at the same time, it spawned the uh, National uh, Historic Landscape, uh, well, National Historic Preservation Movement. Uh, the Act of 1966, for example, definitely is a response to these destructions that were happening in urban areas all over the country. So I think, yes, it is a gap that needs to be crossed. And I think uh, because it was really an Anglo-dominated political move to do this, it's very important for people in preservation and elsewhere to reach out to the Mexican-American community. And it's not that it's going to be easy, but um, you know we don't want that to go on, I guess. Is that a reasonable answer, Corky? <laughs> So in reaching out to the Mexican-American community, is there any one, two, three plan in place at all at this time as to how would we draw the people back to our interests? I think at this point, it's very much in process. I've talked to some people in the Mexican-American American art community, and I think that that might be one of the really beneficial areas to start with because they actually are accepted on both sides of this discussion. 
and I don't really want to name any specific names here, but I think that might be a really good point. I also think talking to the various neighborhood uh, associations, you know, we're sort of in a, right now, in a very, you know, not quite their stage, but if this is accepted, obviously, by mayor and council, then you have to involve all the communities in what happens next. I mean, what happened to the barrio is, I mean, as Cork, just to underscore, is such a, a horrific tragedy and, and really, really one of the great travesties in our community. But it would be horrific if in our generation we allowed this this to happen again and that, uh, you know, it takes time to reflect back and look at these types of resources and say, is this something that is of value to our community? It's interesting that we're at like the 40 year mark. This seems to be a critical time for buildings in general, where will they make it or will they, um, will they go? And landscapes are tremendously fragile because they are a living thing. And so the fact that this landscape has survived, it is so extraordinary. People are using it today as a parking lot. And so what one of the, I mean, l literally people are driving in to this landscape every single day and parking their cars in it and getting out and walking to work. And so that's a, that's a problem. We're not, we as a community aren't caring for our own resources. And this is an investment that this community made, albeit at a, at a time that was really horrific. And I, I suspect that they hired ECBO to come here because there was already a recognition of what a tr horrific and terrible mistake had been made. So this was a way of actually hiring somebody to create an asset for the neighborhoods that were still here that kids could go to in the summer and play in that was attractive to families that was actually uh, 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 an epicenter of all of the, the neighborhoods around the, around the, around the, um, the um, TCC. Actually, before, before I take that question, I want to say one other thing. Garrett Ekbo was one of these people who was totally supportive of a mixed community. He literally publishes this in his book. There was a quotation I was looking at last night that said, landscape is for people. That is all people, Mexicans. Uh, I can't remember the terminology he used at that point, but it was inclusive of every possible ethnic group. And he had worked with the Farm um, Bureau creating uh, living spaces for migrant workers in Arizona and California. Uh, but he was, he was not, uh, he was 4F, whatever that, if that means anything to anybody here. He could not be in military service during the Second World War. And um, instead, he worked for the Farm Bureau. And his goal was to create living spaces for uh, migrant farm workers. And I haven't had a chance really to explore any of these. But I think his philosophy was very much formed by this experience. So I think that may also have had something to do with the choice of ECBO. While he was here, the community was in a conversation about the Butterfield Highway which was going to run through Armory Park and through what was left of, uh, what's left of the Barrio Viejo. And he was very vocally opposed to this. And he wrote letters to the editor and really took a stand and used his influence as this significant landscape architect to stand in the way, in the way of that. There was, there was a question over here somewhere. Well, as Corky pointed out, this was a very tragic uh, piece of history in Tucson in in to, in the, for the Tucson community. And I think it's an example of urban renewal that we invite somebody in from another location to redesign um, a, a portion of Tucson's original landscape in a, in a way that is entirely alien, that uses artificial irrigation canals, um, artificial water, uh, tran moving devices and concrete and entirely non-native uh, vegetation and it seems to me that it would be, uh, this is not a question, it's a comment, but it seems to me that, th that this is worth preserving as a piece of our architectural history. This is what happened that should not have happened save a little tiny half a block of this, you know, a few hundred yards, and then return it 
in some way that involves water harvesting and permaculture and native vegetation and something that's really organic, I don't think that this is an ethnic issue. I think it's an ecological issue. And I think that this was a travesty more against the ecology of the Sonoran Desert than it was against the, the tradition of, uh, of Mexican or Mexican American or Spanish culture. Mm -hmm. I think there's a certain validity to that point of view. And I think part of it is that we have to create a balance. And that's why, you know, as I say, my immediate inclination here was to say, if we're having water in a public space, which I think we should, I don't think that should be hidden away in swimming pools and people's yards. I think it should be there for everyone. And if we do it, we have to do it in an ecologically responsible way. And actually, I spoke to uh, a man. He's part of the Vanishing Treasures program uh, with the National Park Service about whether he felt that it would be feasible to, uh, with rainwater harvesting and condensate, keep the fountains operating. And he said, yes. Now, this is water that we're letting go to waste right now. If we're going to have public water, I feel we should do this in a responsible way. And likewise, you know, with vegetation, yes, it was an import, but this was, first of all, by the way, you know why there's so much uh, concrete and paving? It was because of maintenance. You know, this was really the thing at that point. It was part of the whole modern movement. You won't have any maintenance problems because you'll take out the grass and you won't have to mow it. And so, <laughs> you know, this was, there, there are a lot of things that happened during that time that are not necessarily what we would see now. I do think that we need the trees back down there. You know, the trees have been permitted to die, and one thing that we really need in Tucson is shade, you know. But I think you have a very valid point. We have to do this ecologically, correctly. Okay, we have a couple questions in the back. I was wondering if there'd been any thought to, um, given that the barrio was once there, um, to so integrating some small aspect of a memorial to the barrio. You mentioned that rehabilitation was the, was the going to be the treatment potentially for dealing with this landscape, not to introduce new elements into something that would compromise the integrity of what remains, but perhaps integrate a small element into that landscape that could be a memorial to the barrio that was there before, thereby starting to bridge some of those gaps that you were referring to earlier with regards to the, the wounds that people still feel with regards to that. Memorials are really chancy things. You know, I think someone, the point about a memorial is that somebody owns that memorial. You know, somebody has put it there because of their particular concept. But what we have in that space, almost unrecognizable now, is the El Charo restaurant that was on Broadway, the Salmon Diego house, which was on church and was converted into a restaurant. And then on the west, we have the um, Sosa Fremont Carrillo house. So right in that space, we have the possibility of using these points of reference Unfortunately, right at the moment, they're not being integrated very well into the space. So I think, you know, that would certainly, I don't know, Damien, what do you think about that? But I think if we could find a way to, to make these buildings live within that context, that would certainly uh, promote. Well, the other thing is, you know, Broadway is still there. That's the, that's the part that's kind of freaky about this. Because if you walk through uh, La Placida Plaza in front of where El Charo was, which is where the tourist office is, you're actually tracing the course of Broadway. And it's paved with brick. It leads right into the courtyard of the hotel. So in a way, you know, that street is in its own right, you know, something from, from the past as well. So perhaps, you know, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be critical about the idea of a memorial, 
but rather than a memorial, I think what we need is a presence, you know, something that says, this is part of what we are. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Okay. Thank you all for listening. All righty. Um, if you'll join us on the first Tuesday in October, um, we're going to dial back the clock about a couple hundred years, and uh, Homer Thiel from Desert Archaeology will be here to talk about uh, Tucson's historic abandoned cemeteries. Should be a really interesting presentation. And I'd like to take a moment just to uh, direct your attention towards our cameraman. Um, this cafe program got started because of Shepard Reed's efforts with the U of A Science Cafe. Uh, Shepard's efforts really showed us the way to do science cafes in the first place. He's graciously uh, offered to handle our video duties for, for this season. And Shepard is going to be running the Tumamak uh, lecture series coming up. And if you wouldn't mind just real quickly sharing this. Uh, on, uh, let's see, a week from tomorrow, uh, the 12th of September, I don't know if any of you have ever um, attended one of the lectures up on Tumamak Hill. Um, or seeing some of the old buildings that are up there um, from the Desert Laboratory. Um, but the lecture is held in the old library up on the hill. Um, you can go to the Tumamak blog to find out more about how to attend. And Susie and Paul Fish will be speaking about the uh, archaeology on the hill uh, at our lecture. That's next Wednesday, um, September 12th. And so if any of you would like to join us there, um, it's really an amazingly fascinating place. Probably a lot of you are aware of that. Uh, but uh, that should be a good lecture. And uh, hope to see you there. Take care. Uh, the lecture's at 6. Sorry. Yes, thank you. There's a shuttle at 5.30 at the bottom of the hill. Brilliant. Thank you, Shepard. Okay, everybody, thank you for attending, and uh, we'll see you next month.